Yeah, I'm. Uh... Hey, welcome, welcome to Telugu NRI Radio Facebook Live. And uh, you know, every week, every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Central Time, we associated with the Burgos and uh, Garrison Love Friend and uh, Telugu NRI Radio and uh, Burgos and Garrison present, present USA Immigration. Uh, so we are trying to simply simplify the uh, U.S. immigration information to all audience. So the, here uh, today we here with uh, Attorney Lucas. Uh, hello, Lucas. Welcome the welcome to Telugu NRA Radio. Good evening. Hi, Vinkat. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, Again, look forward to uh, our continued audience uh, growth and participation on our weekly show. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having Telugu and other radio. Uh, I think, uh, how is the day? Oh, everything was great today. It's, you know, busy. Um, you know, uh, just uh, another day uh, at work. So how's, how was your day? Uh, it's a pleasant, uh, good. So, it was, uh, today we posted already a couple of topics uh, before going to topic. Just I want to check with you, it means uh, from October 2, it's going to be released uh, the new visa bulletin or new good news about the 100,000 uh, visa, visa numbers. Do you have any additional information on that we are keeping? Posting, we, we are keeping up, keep updating 100,000 uh, numbers green card fast two weeks. So, do you have any additional information, or you can share? Maybe you can share again, uh, so that uh, it it will uh, uh, it, it 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 help to the all uh, audience. Well, uh, as we discussed the previous uh, two shows, um, you know, we expect the October. Uh, visa bulletin when it's published to to, it, to have a, a key advancements in the EB2 EB3 categories for India, um, and uh, that's going to be due to quite a few of the family based petitions not being used. So the Department of State uh, is hopefully going to reallocate those visas to help the employment based uh, backlog. And you know we should be receiving the new uh, visa bulletin hopefully next week. Um, and, you know, obviously October is going to be the, the first of the fiscal year for USCIS. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a good mix of, uh, or a good movement in the, in the priority dates. And I just want to remind everyone, there's two categories that everyone's familiar with. We have the final action dates and then, uh, the ability to where we can file the adjustments. So, you know, if you have a priority date that is, <clears throat> anywhere from July, June 2009, all the way through probably the entire year of 2010, um, I would be prepared to where you could go ahead and file the adjustment just so um, if anything happens, uh, the dates regress, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the next visa bulletin, you don't miss an opportunity. Yeah, this 100,000 is uh, really good for all eagerly waiting for it, green card holders as we hope it get it was more uh, months maybe it means as we discussed uh, maybe we can expect until june or july 2011 maybe even expecting even move forward uh, thank you lucas uh, recently it means uscs uh, i think uh, changed the process on uh, the H1, H1, it went so look like uh, the current, uh, the premium process uh, earlier it was the uh, two weeks. Now it is maybe it is a slowing process. 
and also it 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 changed the forms and also as a bad news for the h1 holders maybe increase the fees can you share uh, the what is your what eoc is going to be implemented on uh, h1 on this topic yes yeah, so good points there's a couple of points in here i'll just break it down into two separate points um first of all uh, uscis has announced that their new fee schedule will be implemented on october 2nd now currently uh aila american immigration lawyers association whom i'm a member of has filed a, a lawsuit along with one other uh petitioner uh to have an injunction against the implementation of the new fees. So uh I would expect based on what I've seen and heard from other colleagues that you know we're probably going to have a freeze uh on the implementation or from the injunction uh, on the new fee schedule. So um this is going to also impact uh everyone who might file for an adjustment of status application okay one of the big changes would be in the past you would file your adjustment of status the filing fee is 1225 that includes uh work authorization advanced parole uh all included in the one fee and if the new fee schedule is implemented okay which it, as it is right now it's still going to be implemented uh, on uh, the 2nd of October you're going to have to pay an additional uh fees uh for the employment authorization and the advanced parole document okay so there is uh even if you know in the past a lot of people have tried to file on their own these these petitions um if you plan on doing so i mean it's obviously tune into our station and make sure you have the latest updates or you can follow us on our facebook pages uh to see the latest information or consult with an attorney or contact us at our office to to help you with that so there's no mistakes because again if the package is rejected it's going to take 4 or 5 weeks for the package and everything to come back and that's going to be you know over one month next visa bulletin will be out and you you know you might miss an opportunity to file so it's very important to make sure we're up to date on all the fees uh all the required documents to be submitted and all the forms to make sure they're completely uh filled out correctly um And that's the first part. The second part as you were discussing and going back to H1Bs um you know Lucas Lucas yes. here we are talking about the fees right can we it means already you explain the uh, uh H1 EAD and uh, the all packet it means can you elaborate it though? if if we want to any H1 want to apply is any it means how much fee do you have any number how how much is going to be increase and uh, h1 h4 ead uh, h4 and h4 ead do you have in very detail uh, i i don't have it in front of me at the moment um the fees are uh, we can share and post on the facebook page afterwards for h1s h4 h4 ead the the increase is is not as much uh, l1 visa uh, holders the fee increased dramatically um also for you know if you're filing for an adjustment if you want to file the you know again like I did, just explained for adjustment of status now you're going to have to pay for also employment authorization also for advanced parole the biometrics so on and so forth so what i would recommend is just uh you know keep posted uh follow our pages and then keep a, a you know notice of you know what changes there might be and again it's really fluid at the moment so we don't know for sure uh you know if these uh fee increases are actually going to take uh a permanent change you know October 2nd so there's a good chance that i think that the judge will issue um an injunction freezing the application of this new rule with the fee increase uh and then you know thereafter you know once all the co- the court process is handled we have an election coming up this year and probably before the injunction would be lifted if it's if there's an injunction that's um uh applied on this case then at the earliest you know it would be next year and a new administration might have different policies they might reverse this the, the change in the filing fees uh, so on and so forth 
Yeah. Okay. So eventually, we are talking about the H1 now. So the premium process, it means I hear that it, it means USCIC is going to be increased drastically. Nowadays, I think of 1450s of something is it, it increased to the 2000 something or do you have any number on that one? Uh, H1 premium process, any premium process. So right now, um the premium processing fee is $1,440. I guess it is going to potentially increase up to over $2,000. Um, and everyone knows, and whenever you are, um, you have premium processing, that's just basically uh, the ability to have your case processed within two weeks, 15 calendar days, uh, not including if you have an RFE or any other uh, notices in between the submission to the final action on the case. And uh, we've also seen some delays uh, uh, going back towards processing times where this year due to COVID-19, there's been quite a few cases where the two weeks is, has been surpassed quite a bit. And um, we just, at the end of the day, I mean, there's nothing we can to, do to, you know, other than email the officer, call and follow up on the case, um, things like that, or um, uh, push it forward any any faster. So what we typically do is we'll try and get the case adjudicated as fast as possible, but then request the premium processing filing fee to be returned. Okay. So it means that I hear the premium process uh, is getting slow, slow, slow process. It means earlier, earlier also it is a uh, fifteen business days or two business uh, business weekends. So what 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 is going to be changed? The H one uh, premium process is going going to be slowed down. Well, the premium processing is always the fifteen days calendar days, and uh, which basically is two weeks. Um, here recently, you know, we've seen a lot of cases where we'll get to the the. <coughs> Eve before the deadline for a decision to be made, and uh, you know the case uh, will all of a sudden get an RFE or uh, something similar to that. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think some of these officers use this as a tool to buy more time. Again, you know, all the officers are working remotely, as you know most of us are, and um, there is certain logistical issues where you know officers have to go pick up or get the cases assigned to them, there's communication going back and forth about even issuing receipts or whatever it might be. So uh, there, there is a higher delay now than, than normal. Okay, it meant, so this is the, due to the COVID, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic situation or is any, uh, naturally it is uh, going to be delayed or is any uh, USA is imposing to uh, slow down the process? Well, that's a good point. Uh, good question. I, I, I'll go ahead and pivot on that to let you to, to explain. I mean, this year has been, uh, you know, uh, there's been a, a lot of action in the H-1B area. So there was a um, a case that was filed in uh, Washington, D.C. Circuit where um, US, uh, IT Serve Alliance sued USCIS and IT Serve Alliance is, you know, uh, a nonprofit entity entity that is made up of uh, members who own consulting companies or, um, you know, similar companies, what most everyone works for uh, within the H-1B, you know, um, the field. Uh, so what they did is uh, they had a settlement with USCIS that rescinded the uh, requirement for itinerary of services and also rescinded the uh, new field memo and it rescinded this uh, specialty occupation, third party offsite employment, where we have to show all the contracts, um, all the client letters, vendor letters, uh, and so on and so forth to, sh to establish that by a preponderance of the evidence, evidence that we qualify for a specialty occupation. Um, so that was good for a few months. And now there's been action where USCIS is going to propose a new rule. Uh, I think the terminology uh, for the new rule is going to be, um, uh, let me see what the exact word of this. Um,
strengthening the H-1B non-immigrant classification program. So I think what this rule is going to do is go forward with what the previous policies were. And, you know, based upon our administrative law under the Administrative Procedures Act, uh, USCIS or any administrative agency is supposed to uh, publish a proposed rule. There's a comment period uh, where people can comment. And before there's a final action, you know, there's plenty of notice and uh, planning that's done. You know, uh, comments are received, things like that, before full the rule is finally implemented. Um, so I would imagine, it, we don't know any of the information yet, but I would speculate that it's probably going to go back, you know, what the uh, USCIS has settled in that lawsuit, they're going to go back and do things correctly, which is basically they're going to try and reimpose the same rule that was there before, uh, but do it through the proper channels this time. Okay. Yes, sir. That was a, that was a very good information. So the local segments uh, I saw is... Uh, the USCIS is going to be implement, uh, bringing to the uh, maybe new forms. Uh, it means, uh, is there any uh, is any H1 holders or H1 holders can be it means, uh, need to be focused on or need to be taken care on those forms or is only pure related to the attorneys and employers? Can you give them more information on the one so that everyone know what is going to be changed on existing forms or uh, it means, anybody want to eye on those forms, maybe just give, give us some citation, some information on that. Well, forms are updated, you know, all the time, uh, depending on which forms they are, you know, we, you would be referring to, you know, maybe an I-129 uh, petition document. Um, and there's various supplements that are included with that petition. Uh, most attorneys are on top of the current forms to use uh, and stay up to date on that to where the, the, petition will be uh, rejected. Um, another thing to consider, too, is as we discussed last week, you know, most all uh, H-1B beneficiaries know that the petitioner or the organization that sponsors them for the, for the job actually is the one who's responsible for the filing and everything else. So even if you're filing a case, some uh, petitioners let employees review the forms and things like that. Most don't. That uh, for the most part, uh, I think, you know, most all attorneys, if you have a, you're an attorney handling your case, are always up to date on the current forms of what to use and what not to use. Okay, it means uh, this purely related to the employers and um, the attorneys, right? The H1 holders, even, even, even they don't care, even, even we don't know uh, what, is, what are the forms involved and in apply to the H1 so just uh, curious to get to know everyone even say is any new forms going to be implemented or is any uh, us is asking the, any new information from the new forms or just uh, uh, there is my mind uh, this new changes so yeah yeah you, this yeah. this past year there's been a few changes um so most notably uh like we discussed before there's there was a form for a public charge or public burden uh, form that was introduced, there was a, an injunction stopping it, then the injunction was lifted, it was applied, then another lawsuit was filed and an injunction applied because of COVID-19. So, you know, it, it is important to stay up to date. You know, all attorneys, I'm sure, subscribe either on Twitter or get email notifications from USCIS about changes and things like that. Uh, most notably also is in relation to the H-1B uh, petitions. If you file a change of status or an extension um, this year, since, you know, this other public charge policy was introduced, you know, we have to notate on the form if the beneficiary, the employee, has received any public assistance. If so, what kind of public assistance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a couple of pages added, but... Um, you know, like I said, it, it, most of the time, uh, attorneys are pretty much well on top of any filing fees that change, any forms that change, or any filing requirements of, you know, addresses change all the time. You know, uh, here, a lot of uh, consulting companies are in uh, Irving, Texas. So for a while, you know, we had to file for the, the beneficiary was working. We had to look and see which service center we had filed for there. Uh, if we filed an extension, it went to Nebraska. 
Uh, if you file a cap case, it went to Vermont or California. And so a lot of these uh, regulations are fluid or requirements are fluid and they change a lot. So it's just, you know, that's, that's yeah, part of the uh, benefit of having an attorney. So we know and we always know the correct thing to do. Yeah, Lucas, here one question. Anyway, so uh, how does it work if you, if you apply the H1B? Uh, how would I know my application goes to the so-and-so center? Is any the formula? Is any it, it go to the random? Any application go to the random centers, or how does it work? So, good question. Um, if you have a, a a petitioner who's located in Texas, uh, you know the those petitions are filed at the Texas Service Center. Uh, in the past, some petitioners were in Oklahoma. Those would go to Nebraska, but you know, this March it was changed where those go now to Texas Service Center. Um, it, it just really depends on what the USCIS does is they try and uh, balance out all the the work uh, to where there's no delays and it's a constant uh, adjustment because there's so many petitions filed. And uh, here recently, so this year a good example would be. Um, we have a lot of cases that were filed. Uh, there's two places you can file your cap case, either Vermont or California. Uh, and when you did the H-1B registration tool online, you would get uh, a receipt and it would tell you where you file your case. So a lot of cases that were filed in Vermont, you know, they'll issue transfer notices. They'll go to Nebraska or they could go uh, to Texas or California or any other service center. So there's what they're always trying to do is balance the workload so that they can avoid as many delays as possible. Okay. That is a good information. So always is, um, uh, even so, the, when, when we apply, sometimes it goes to the Nebraska, sometimes it goes to the West Coast, California, sometimes it goes to Texas. We never understand how does it work uh, while right. applying apply this uh, H1. Well, the, the information's on the USCIS website, so you, all you have to do is identify where the petitioner's headquarters are located or their main business address, and you can see the corresponding uh, service center where it should be filed. Uh, once you get a receipt, you know, it's really easy to know the <clears throat> service center. If it starts with uh, WAC, that's California. EAC is Vermont. LIN is Nebraska. SRC is Texas. So, um, you know, it, if anyone needs any help knowing that, I mean, you can always reference USCIS.gov or, you know, reach out to us and we can try and help answer any questions you might have regarding that. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thanks for information. So next we go for the, I think the Department of Homeland Security uh, is proposing the new regulation to change the H1 requirement. The, what is going to be proposing new regulation. Do you have any information on that one? We kind of spoke about this a few minutes ago. Um, I, I really believe uh, at the moment that it's going to, you know, they're trying to go through the rulemaking process to implement the policies that were uh, agreed uh, to be rescinded this, this past uh, uh, May or April. And, um, they could add a few points, and they might not add all the points uh, that were previously there, but I'm sure it's going to focus on right to control. So, you know, we all know about itinerary of services. We all know client letters, vendor letters, uh, MSAPO, uh, work product, you know, all the extra evidence that was there in the past that had grown over the past four or five years, really, um, I, I think that that's going to be the main focus. But as of right now, the, nothing's published. Uh, we just have notification because we can notice whenever a new rule is in the process of maybe uh, being published. Uh, so no other information is official at the moment. But uh, if I were to speculate, I mean, uh, USCIS is going to want to to look at see what the employ uh, right to control, employer-employee relationship, the third-party offsite employment, uh, et cetera. Just similar to what it was uh, six months ago. Yeah. So if you hear any changes or any the new uh, 
uh, any changes from USCIS or DHS, everyone will going to be think what is what are the what are the changes are taking taking care events in bringing to the system. So everyone will be scared. Is anything kind of uh, it going to be tight or events? We don't know uh, in the initial stages. The, whenever we hear the new changes, uh, events everyone will the fear about that one. So we will, yeah, yeah. That is a uh, my question. Uh, Lucas, it means if you go for the next uh, the topic, is a, what is a public access file requirement? The first time I'm hearing, it means is there any related to the H1 holders or is any related to is is any is any H1 holder focus on this topic or can you give the your your sure. information? So that's a good question. Uh, the, again, this is a lot of information. We're going to kind of condense and kind of cover as broadly as possible so we're not confusing anyone or getting too much detail. So a petitioner, uh, which is typically the company that someone works for, is required to maintain a public access file for every uh, LCA filed on behalf of any uh, beneficiary. So uh, what does this mean? Well, we have to have certain requirements met that the employer gave certain um, notification to other uh, American workers or other workers at the same uh, incline or wherever the job is located, notifying them that there's, um, you know, uh, someone that's going to be sponsored uh, under H-1B or uh, E-3 visa or, you know, H-1B-1 or whatever the labor certification is, uh, labor condition application is, is uh, designated for. So what we have to do is there's a posting period. Uh, we need to keep track of the posting. The employer or HR is going to have to show that it was posted in a conspicuous location for a certain period of time. They're going to have to sign off on that. They're going to have to state what are the benefits that they might provide for their employees. So do they provide health insurance? Do they provide 401k? Do they provide any other uh, disability or any other benefit and we need to know um you know who are the uh, uh non uh, the exempt employees for h1b so if when we file lca we can uh be exempt from additional uh, attestations by saying that the employer is h1b um it's exempt because either the Position is uh, requires uh, sixty thousand. It, it pays more than sixty thousand per year, or a master's degree um, is you know required for the position, or both. So, um, uh, if you have that information and, it's, and you're exempt, you have to keep a list of all exempt employees uh, within the public access file. And what most people uh, I find when we do audits is the concept of we think. Uh, for example, Vincat, that you have a public access file for yourself. And that, that's not necessarily the, the case. That's not the truth. We, we don't want to identify the LCA with any uh, foreign worker. We want to keep this uh, anonymous because, we, you know, it's, again, it's a public access file. You wouldn't feel comfortable if anyone could just walk into someone's office and get your personal information. So a lot of employers make a mistake where they're not keeping – the public, public access, access file separate, separate from, from like, like a personnel, personnel file. A uh, personnel file would have like an I-9, might have your uh, H-1B approvals, um, you know, other private information that you wouldn't want to share with the public. And that public access file is <coughs> exactly what it sounds. Uh, anyone can come in and request access to that file so they can review and see, uh, you know, uh, the circumstances for that employment. It means so. Uh, this is purely related to the empire, so they they can take care about uh, the personal file and the the public file. So yeah, thanks for sharing the information, Lucas. So even so, we are talking about the hundred thousand uh, green card uh, is going to be added. On top of it, I have a question uh, about uh, applying to I I one forty petition or four eighty five. What is the Pro ability to pay an I-140 petition? Well, that's a good question. So, again, um, whenever you're filing for an I-140, 
there's a there's a huge benefit if the uh, beneficiary or the employee is already working for the petitioner. Uh, in that regards, you can show the ability to pay the proffered wage uh, by using the existing payroll. So if a company has, let's say, 50 uh, employees and all 50 are in H-1B status uh, and all 50 are from India, right? So the, the visas are not going to be readily available. So, you know, we're going to have to show for 50 people that you have the ability to pay. Now, this can become difficult if you pay on average, like let's say the LCA uh, prevailing wage is 80000 and we request our prevailing wage for the perm, and it comes back 94000 right? So there's a delta of $14,000. So we have to show the petitioner the company has the ability to pay the additional $14,000 to the employee, even though the visa is not going to be available for some time, uh, many, many years in the future, we still have to show that at the moment in time when we filed that the petitioner had the ability to pay the proffered wage. Uh, so if you add that 14 k and you multiply it in this example times 50, um, you can imagine uh, that's how much profit the petitioner is going to have to show. And USCIS doesn't always have uh, you know, direct up-to-date information. So what USAS might do is they might issue an RFE uh, for this, and they might request in the fiscal year, this in the calendar year 2019, how many I-140s did you file, list all the I-140s, list if they're approved or the status, the case number, um, if someone applied for adjustment of status, so on and so forth. And within that, that's usually how will navigate that RFE or that process. So, um, you know, th th it's a challenge for smaller companies or people who are starting out in this industry. Uh, you want to make sure that you cover all, uh, all the, the main um, uh, factors, main elements for this filing requirement before you start the process because the process is expensive uh, as far as like investing in advertising. It's a timely process. We all know some. if you're getting close to your sixth year and you're in year four and a half or five, you don't have any time to waste. And you don't want a, uh, your employer to, to maybe make a mistake or not be able to uh, have everything taken care of so you can extend beyond your sixth year or get that H4 EAD that you, <clears throat> your spouse might require. Okay. That's, uh, that is really good information, Lucas. So... If you go to the next next topic on now, I think uh, your USCIS is giving some flexibility to it. Means it, I think it extended some flexibility for responding to the request. It means, can you give the more more updates on this one? Yes, uh, so that's a good point. So in March of this year, USCIS uh, gave a extra time for uh, applicants, petitioners to respond to requests for evidence, notice of intent to deny, notice of intent to revoke, um, appeals, motions to reopen, reconsider uh, due to the COVID-19. So uh, anything, any notice that was dated March 1st and now has been extended to July 1st of 2020 any, any notice in that time frame that's dated, you'll have an extra 60 days to respond, uh, to have a timely response. Now, um, I know some people panic. I, I always try and respond to any RFE as soon as we get the evidence within a day or two. Uh, and we, you know, I'm usually uh, really pushing people to respond, you know, as soon as possible because we don't like waiting till the last minute. Um, but you know, extra time. So I know some people pan are panicked because they think the deadline's approached and passed and the attorney might not have re sent the response yet, but there is a little bit of a grace time now. So just because you don't see the update on the case status doesn't mean your case is going to be denied because it wasn't filed within that, by that deadline. I think this is a, some breathing period to respond the RFEs, any questions to USCS. Definitely, that is a good news to who got the RFEs have some extended time to respond. So, yeah, Lucas, it means um, 
I think consulate are open. Maybe the consulate are, are you issuing the visas. I mean, consulate is uh, issuing all visas, or is any specific uh, 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 is any specific uh, which is visas are issuing? Do you have any information on that one? Well, the as we discussed before, J visas, F M H ones. Uh, are still, you know, under the presidential proclamation, you know, going to be suspended for the moment uh, until the end of the year. Um, now, if you can get um, a waiver <clears throat> for this, you obviously can go in and get stamped. Or if you qualify for, you know, Dropbox, you can go ahead and uh, do a Dropbox. Now, Dropbox stamping has been uh, um, allowed where there's a greater grace period. So I think if someone had a stamp within the past year, uh, you can qualify for Dropbox. But uh, that, again, there's no, as far as appointments and things of that sort, um, nothing has changed on that front. What, what has changed is for Dropbox applications of visas in certain circumstances. And uh, you'd have to, you know, make sure you qualify for that um, before you, you, you know, make that, start that process. And then, as far as immigrant-based uh, visas, you know, certain uh, family-based visas, things like that, they're still, you know, proceeding as, as they were. It's just limited amount of people are allowed uh, to the appointments. And uh, so it's a longer maybe wait. But, uh, you know, if you have a family member back home and they're going through the uh, family-based process, they'll go to uh, Mumbai. They'll have their schedule, their appointment scheduled and, and uh, all that. But... Uh, as far as like in Hyderabad, Chennai, for visa stamping for H1, H4, you know, you'd be a Dropbox uh, situation. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Uh, do you have any additional updates about H1 or green card or H4 EAD process on today? Well, I think one, a good note to end on for our show would be um, to be prepared with what you're going to need to, what you want to do. You know, if you want to file for adjustment of status uh, and the visa becomes, you know, the filing dates become available where you can file your adjustment, you need to be prepared to know exactly what do you want to do. So do you want to maintain your non-immigrant status, uh, which is a good idea throughout the time of, which means staying on H-1B while your adjustment's pending? Uh, which could take, you know, a year plus, or if the dates regress, you know, you might be in a, um, a holding pattern like some some other people for a year and a half or two years. Do you want to work on EAD? Uh, you know, and that, this is a decision to start thinking about now because these, uh, um, for, for things were in the past, I've always filed uh, adjustments with EAD and advanced parole because it's all included in one price. But if the fees go up, do you want to pay the extra fee to have that? Do you want to um, consider that at the time? I mean, I would recommend that. Um, but a lot of it is, you know, being prepared. And what I would recommend is for anyone who has any opportunity for their priority date could be uh, any time between 2009 for the whole year 2010, uh, reach out to an attorney Get the steps uh, for the process. Figure out exactly what the plan is. So when, you know, the October comes around, it, you can go ahead and file the case as soon as possible. Um, at my office, we use uh, software that allows the individuals to go ahead and upload all the documents, answer questionnaires, and it's an automated process. You know, just if, you, if that's the case, you know, most attorneys will let you go ahead and start that process before you actually... Uh, um, officially start working on the case so we have all the evidence required uh, you, know, you know we can see what's there what might be missing and then you can make a decision to file at a later time or not so again it's very important just to be prepared uh, find out and work with each whoever you're going to work with with attorney find out their policies and procedures um, it you know and another thing to consider too is uh, the timeliness of having the petition prepared so how well of a relationship do you have with attorney? What is the plan? What if attorney's taking your case? You know, you might need to find out what if I have everything provided to you, 
and we're set to file uh, October 2nd, but the attorney has 300 other cases. Where are you within the 300? Is there a guarantee of when the attorney's planning on filing the case? If so, what is the expected date? Um, so these are all questions you need to ask and communicate, but you know, uh, before it's too late, because you don't want to waste any time with this, because if you get to the end of the month, you know, maybe the following month things regress and you might, your date might not be available anymore to file. Yes, uh, I agree. Lucas, everyone looking for the, the green card application. So we know that it's going to be added 100,000 numbers into the 100,000 numbers so that events, as you said, is a, it should be be prepared before the number comes to the uh, visa bulletin. If everyone be ready, so they can benefit it, they can be uh, applied without any error so that it it, it, up, it benefit to their, their, to them and their family. So, yeah, it means as it, you, <coughs> you, it means uh, everyone, please be uh, alert on this uh, green card application. Please be <coughs> prepared, get the information, collect the documentation and uh, approach your attorney or you can reach out to the the Lucas, if you have any question, you can drop an email. You can call to the Lucas. Uh, the whatever, if you if you have any question, just uh, reach out to the Lucas. And he can clarify so that you can be prepared for the apply for 485. It coming on October two. The everyone saying this October two to very important because we are waiting for the long lasting the green card numbers. We know that uh, we are getting the hundred thousand numbers. So. Whoever eligible this time frame, 2009 and December 2010, please, please be uh, prepared and collect the documents and be prepared uh, for apply the 485. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Lucas, for giving your updates for this week. This week, uh, all we are we we are um, uh, go the web webinar every Wednesday 6 p.m. Central Time. So whatever, if you have any questions, if you if you have any uh, any question, just post to post on uh, Facebook Facebook page, thank you and our radio and uh, the Burgos and Burgos and Gas and uh, Facebook, so that we are ready to help to you, and uh, we are ready to give the more information on the immigration system, so that everyone get to know and uh, uh, get to know and act for right direction without any any issues so thank you lucas for this week uh, we can connect the next week uh, we can come up with the new updates and uh, new more information and more questions thank you thank you very much being with telu and our radio thank you venkat and uh, again following up on your point you know next week our show should have a lot more up-to-date information in regards to the uh, visa bulletin so uh, I would encourage, please, you know, follow us on Facebook. Uh, we'll send notifications on the updated show. And uh, if there's any questions or any topics anyone would like to address or cover, please feel free to comment to Telugu NRI Radio. And then Kat and I will uh, try and address everyone's questions accordingly. Uh, Lucas, it means uh, before ending the show, it means we have a question. The Satish is asking, do you know uh, do you know which applications are pending? Even do you have any numbers or do you have any dates? The green card num green card numbers or green card dates are pending or processing now? I don't have the exact number in front of me. I didn't uh, have that ready, but you know typically there's a you know a few hundred or so to a thousand at any one time, depending, I had to pull the information. It's a public information on USCIS website. Um, it, what you can kind of gauge and see, and most people make predictions, is you can see who's already filed, uh, what cases are pending, the final action dates, and then what, how many visas are available. So going back over uh, what we discussed, you know, October 1st is the new year for USCIS and the government. It's the beginning of the new fiscal year. And that's when all the visas 
become available again for the next year. That's why, you know, like our H1 start date is 10-1. Uh, you know, that's the start of the fiscal year. Uh, so what we do is we allocate and see how many, you know, visas are used uh, per month. And then we kind of can see the queue, uh, EB1, EB2, EB3, EB5, you know, how many are pending at that uh, point. And then we can also see, you know, family-based petitions and see how the numbers move. And there's, you know, uh, predictions are made on, uh, based on those numbers, right? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Satish, it means uh, currently we don't have any, the perfect, uh, it means the uh, uh, exact numbers or dates. Maybe we will try to provide, we will try to get and provide, and we will try to give more information on that. Uh, what, are, Which application are pending right now? The anyway, it means if you, if anyone fall into the 2009 to the 2010 December, then there is a rough estimation. Is any waiting for the green card? Uh, we know that uh, by October 2nd or maybe by October, it's going to be add uh, new numbers just to be ready so that you can you can apply for this time frame yeah yeah thank you thank you lucas thank you very much for being with telegram on our radio good evening um uh, yeah we are wrapping this session thanks for watching the telegram on our radio web, uh, facebook live we are continue every week wednesday uh, wednesday 6 p.m central time please be post your questions and Facebook page, we are ready to help to you and uh, we are trying to provide the more information on USA immigration systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucas. Uh, thank you. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.